I would like to take everybody on the journey of how I almost killed my best friend with cannabis. I'm a screenwriter. I graduated from the Australian Film and Television School in uh, 1992. And in the same year, who also graduated with me was um, a Polish guy called Jacek. Over the course of the next 20 years, we became very, very close friends. We spent a lot of time working together. We spent a lot of time traveling together. As a matter of fact, I was also um, the best man at his wedding. We did everything together, but the one thing that we never really did together was cannabis. It wasn't something that interested me, and he always saw cannabis as uh, something that was a drug. And if you started taking cannabis, you would become a drug addict, and really horrible things would happen. So in um, 2015, um, Jacek, one morning when he was shaving, felt a lump. He had a lump um, in his neck, ab about here. So he went to a doctor. The doctor looked down his throat and sent him to get some tests done. The tests came back positive for malignant cells. Those four words were amazing because those four words suddenly changed his life and to a certain extent, my life. And it sort of started us on a cancer journey. By the time Jacek was diagnosed, the only option really open to him was radiation therapy. Now, we were told that it would be um, six bouts of radiation over the course of six weeks. First day of radiation came, uh, the first week, and we went through it. It was, it was easy. The second week, fantastic, it, even better. We went through it. There was absolutely no side effects. The third week, everything changed. The third week, we did the radiation, then quickly after the radiation, he started having an, a, a real excruciating pain in his throat. Uh, he wasn't able to swallow, he wasn't able to drink, um, it hurt to speak, and it, it even hurt to breathe. And I, re I remember around that period, I, I, I said to him, I said, um, what's it feel like? Like, what, what, what do you feel? And he said to me, think about getting a steak, uh, a piece of meat, okay? Think about laying it out on a, um, a chopping board, okay? Then getting a piece of barbed wire and putting it on the steak and rolling up this steak. So you're making either a, a, a barbed wire kebab or a barbed wire sausage roll, then hold the steak and just yank the barbed wire out. And he said, that's how my throat feels all the time. And I thought, okay, we're at week three, we've got three more weeks to go. So if he feels like that now, boy, are we in trouble. So the next couple of days, we had an appointment with the oncologist. <laughs> And um, my intention, my aim, was to try and find something, find either a, a stronger painkiller or hopefully that the oncologist would say, you know what, um, what he's taking now, double the dose. Um, that didn't happen. It was made quite clear that in terms of painkillers, we were at the end of the line. There was nothing else that he could give us. We were the strongest thing that he could give us. And in terms of dose, anything more than what he was taking would mean overdose. So I, I, I sat there and listened to this and I really felt that it kind of wasn't good enough um, because I thought, you know, I thought, uh, how's it possible? You know, we're, we're, we're medical science is so advanced, there must be something, there has to be something. So I pushed and I pushed and I pushed as I do. And um, he basically, um, I think out of desperation to try and get us out of there, basically said, look, you know, I've heard, I can't, this is not official, but I've heard, okay, that some patients have had positive results with um, cannabis. And for me, that was um, that little glimmer of hope. You know, he, he made it quite clear that um, he wasn't advocating the use of cannabis, he wasn't promoting it. Uh, he wasn't suggesting that we go out and buy cannabis. You know, it was just something that he'd heard, and that was it. So basically that night, um, I Google researched, I Google researched cannabis. I made some phone calls to work out, you know, where does one go about buying marijuana? Um, also because we're, look, we're talking about 2015, you know, this is a time where it was prior to the whole hype of um, the whole world legalizing. It was still very much illegal in a lot of parts of the world. So anyway, um, with my limited knowledge, uh, the next day, I sort of got ready to go out and buy my first lot of cannabis. 
So I ended up in a pub and I was told, okay, that in this pub there was a guy that everybody knew as Spider. And um, Spider was basically known in the area as somebody that sold cannabis. So I, I walked into the pub um, and kind of in the pool room where you know, guys were playing pool, uh, there was a bloke with um, a spider web tattooed on his elbow. And I kind of thought, well, either he's, he is Spider or he would know somebody called Spider. So um, I, I went up to him and I said, um, excuse me, well, I'm looking for a bloke called Spider. And he said to me, that's my name, don't wear it out, what can I do you for? And I said, um, oh, I'm here to buy marijuana. He goes, mate, no, not here, come to the office. Mm. I said, all right. So I followed him to the office, the office being the public toilet. And um, we then went into the dispensary area of the toilet, one of the cubicles. And basically deep in his cannabis safe, that is down his pants, he pulled out <laughs> A, um, a bag of um, marijuana. So I said to him, I said, um, what, can you tell, you know, what, what, what can you tell me about it? He goes, mate, it's weed. I said, um, yeah, okay. Um, can you tell me what's in it? Can you just tell me something about it? And he said, mate, this is bloody good shit. <laughs> and at, at that point, I kind of thought, well, you know, this is probably as good as it's going to get in terms of uh, a how-to guide from Spider. So I paid him, and I took my bloody good shit, and um, I went to Yatsik's house. And at Yatsik's house, um, you know, we rolled a joint, and he smoked the joint. And what I was expecting that would happen were, it would be something miraculous. I was hoping that suddenly he'd smoke on this joint, he'd jump up and he'd say, I feel bloody terrific, let's go to the pub. But that didn't happen. Um, what actually did happen was we started talking about um, the cancer journey that you know, he was going through, that we were going through, and how that might make a documentary. And then started talking about, rather than being a documentary, it might actually make a feature film. And then we started working out, okay, who would play him, who would play me, and of course, who would play Spider. Um, and we spoke like this for about an hour. Then, you know, after about an hour, he said to me, mate, I, I, he said, mate, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a bit hungry. I said, not a problem. Um, I can either blitz the steak, the salad, or the pasta for you. You tell me, I can blitz it so you can try drinking it. Um, and I made him something to eat. And that night, he actually ate something, okay? He ate, the pain was still there, but he managed to actually put something down. For an hour, we spoke about something that we hadn't spoken about for months. Like, for that one hour, the conversation wasn't the usual conversation that we were having in, that, in those last couple of weeks, which was around the cancer, which was around the upcoming therapy, which was, which was around the possible pain. It wasn't about any of these things. It was a conversation like the conversations we used to have at film school, like we used to have when we were making films, like we used to have three months ago. And at that point, I realized that what the cannabis had done, it had taken Yatsik away from the pain. Um, it, it basically had taken him somewhere where the pain was, it was still there, but it was manageable. And in his headspace, it was no longer a headspace of the fact, okay, that he was potentially dying. It was a headspace of, you know, maybe we can do something about this. Yatsik weighed about 80 kilos when he started therapy. By the end of it, he was down to about 42 kilos. I'm positive it was cannabis that actually saw Yatsik through the radiation therapy journey. I'm convinced even today that it was cannabis that actually saved his life. It was, it was interesting because it was my first impact with cannabis and I started looking into it, studying it and sort of trying to get my head around it. It suddenly dawned on me what I had done. And I think this was the hard thing for me to sort of come to grips with. I had gone into a bar, I'd gone into a public toilet, and I'd met with somebody that I didn't know, and I bought something that I didn't know anything about. And then I gave this to my best friend who was ill. And that scared me. It scared me because with the research I was doing, I, um, I learned that um, in illegal cannabis, cannabis that you buy off the streets, it's quite common to find things like um, heavy metals, uh, ground glass, and bug spray. 
the, you know, these are common things that if you analyze the sort of stuff that you buy off, off the street, potentially you'll find some of these chemicals in there. And it scared me because knowing, okay, that I had given somebody something that I didn't know about, I then started thinking, okay, what if there was something in this drug that might have had some sort of allergic reaction with, with Yatsek? What if there was something in this drug or some chemical that had been placed in this drug that might have had an adverse reaction to the other drugs he was taking? And that really threw me. It threw me because during the period that Yatsik was ill um, and I was cooking for him, I would spend a long time in supermarkets, making sure that what I was buying was organic, looking at packages, and very paranoid about not feeding him something that had chemicals that were unnecessary. I was very paranoid about not putting toxins into a body that had a very frail immune system at the moment. And yet, I didn't think twice about you know going to a pub, going into a toilet, and basically buying a drug that I didn't know anything about from somebody that I didn't know. I had a duty of care. I had a duty of care to somebody, okay, who was not well. So it was my responsibility to actually do the best possible thing for this person, to look after their interest. That was my duty of care, to look after their interest. And I thought about that, and I thought about, okay, so where does the buck stop? Especially when we are in a society, where we're in a world, okay, where something like um, medicinal cannabis or cannabis full stop, at the moment, it's spiraling. Like, you know, in 2015, it was all about legalization. It was all about whether this country would legalize. Now in 2019, it's not about legalization anymore. Um, you know, the whole world is legalizing at a rapid rate. It's gone beyond that, I think. You know, like a, a, class, a, a classic example is, this is a, a product that you can purchase in anywhere in Europe. It's made in Switzerland. It is basically CBD medicinal oil. And when I look at this box and I kind of go, okay, so what's in it? It basically says contains 4% CBD in an olive oil carrier. That's all it says. There's nothing else. How different basically is this label to the way Spider was labeling his stuff? It doesn't tell me how it's grown. It doesn't tell me what strain um, it, it's come from. It doesn't tell me how it's, it's been extracted. It doesn't tell me if there are any you know, minute traces of heavy metals or pesticides, which are bug sprays. It doesn't tell me any of that. So it sort of puts me in that position where I kind of think, with the world um, at the moment, um, legalizing at the great rate that it is, and with the world also getting inundated and flooded with products like this. That, you know, there are a lot of these products on the internet, there are a lot of these products in countries where medicinal cannabis is legal, you can walk into a chemist and buy this. And yet there isn't a standardization where you know, I can actually get a really clear understanding of what is in this. People that are producing a, a cannabis product, they have a responsibility. They've got a responsibility to the people who are growing it. They've got a responsibility to the environment they're actually growing this within. And of course, they've got a, a responsibility to the final, you know, the end user. So if they're not labeling their stuff, it puts them in the same kind of situation as some bloke in a public toilet selling this sort of stuff straight out of his underpants. And to be honest with you, I, I, I don't think it's good enough. It's not good enough because it's really you know, up to all of us to hold the people who make this sort of stuff accountable. And it's also up to us to demand that these people have a duty of care from seed to sale. Thank you very much.